good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Salisa Vekeman, and I will be moderating this panel organized by uh, FIZ Karlsruhe, the Leibniz, Leibniz Institute for Information Infrastructure. I work for the European Commission in the Director General Justice and Consumers in the unit that deals with international data flows and protection. And in that capacity, I'm actually one of the members of the Commission's team that deals with uh, anything related to the follow up to the Schrems II judgment of the Court of Justice. And the Schrems II judgment is also what we're going to focus on uh, during today's panel. A lot has already been said about this, this judgment during webinars, blogs, events. There's been a lot of academic discussions or discussions looking at it more from a policy perspective. But today we're going to focus specifically on the practical consequences of the judgment. So what it means in practice for compliance with international transfer rules of the GDPR and what it means for different sectors. And I don't want to spend too much time on this general introduction, but just to briefly recall um, what the judgment was about. In the Schrems II judgment, which was issued by the Court of Justice of the European Union last July, the court pronounced itself on two instruments under the GDPR for international data transfers. On one hand, the court invalidated the EU-US privacy shield, which was a framework that allowed personal data to flow freely from the EU to participating companies in the US. And on the other hand, the court confirmed the validity of another transfer tool, the standard contractual clauses. Um, but at the same time, the court also further clarified the conditions under which these clauses can be used. Um, and since then, we've seen different actions in response to the judgment. The European Data Protection Board issued guidance in November, setting out the steps that companies and other entities have to take to comply with the judgment. And on the side of the Commission, we initiated talks with uh, the United States to explore the possibility of a successor for the Privacy Shield, so a new and strengthened framework. And in addition, we also issued draft modernized standard contractual clauses that, among other novelties, also incorporate some of the clarifications provided by the court in the Schrems II case, again, to assist with compl compliance efforts. Um, as I already mentioned during today's panel, we want to explore specifically how the Schrems II judgment has impacted compliance with the rules on international data transfers. So what are the key issues that the judgment has raised from a compliance perspective, what strategies are being developed to facilitate compliance, and are there any differences in the impact of compliance between different sectors and jurisdictions? We have four panelists today. They come from different backgrounds. We have people coming from legal practice, from research, from the regulators, and they deal with different areas from the private sector to health research to the other protection in the public sector. So I think this will allow us to approach today's topic from different angles. So before giving them the floor, let me just briefly introduce our, our panelists. Uh, we have Nikolaus Tildorakis, who is an off-counsel in the Brussels office of Wilson, Sonsini, Kudrich and Rosati, where he focuses on privacy and cybersecurity issues. Our second panelist is Eduardo Usteran, who is a partner in the Google Privacy and Information Management practice of Hogan Novels, and he's an internationally recognized expert in privacy and data protection law. Our third panelist for today is Kira Staunton, who is a senior lecturer in law at Middlesex University in London, and also a research associate at the University of Cape Town and a consultant to the South African National Health Laboratory Service. And last but not least, we have uh, Leonardo Severo Navas, who is a director of the Office of the European Data Protection Supervisor. Uh, so these are our four panelists. Uh, for the structure of this panel, we will have introductory remarks, presentation from each of our panelists. I will kindly ask them to limit themselves to around 10 minutes maximum, so we have sufficient time for uh, discussion and for questions from the audience. So without further ado, I will give then the floor to our first speaker, uh, Nikolaus. So Nikolaus, as a, a council, you of course focus on, on different aspects, on non-contentious issues, but also on uh, investigations and cooperation with supervisory authorities. So from your practical experience, how are businesses approaching compliance with the Schrems II judgment? Do you see 
any priorities or specific areas that businesses are, are focusing on? Do you see any interesting best practices or compliance tools being developed? I'd be very interested to hear your views on these uh, topics. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Alisa, for the very informative introduction and these very interesting questions. Um, I'm sure we could spend several hours discussing uh, all of those, because uh, indeed, uh, postrams to uh, companies around the world have been trying to decipher what the judgment means and what they actually need to do uh, to practically comply with terms to in a meaningful way. Um, as you laid out, there have been a number of initiatives since July. Uh, so I've prepared uh, a brief PowerPoint presentation. Uh, it'd be great if we could uh, see that uh, so that I, I, I guide you through uh, the main uh, things that I see in practice that companies have been doing uh, since July. So. Um, the, the structure of this 10 minute presentation, because uh, I want to make sure that we have enough time later on for questions and for a very interesting discussion with the esteemed uh, panelists, is um, I'm going to go through very quickly the practical developments. Um, I mean, Alisa has uh, already mentioned those uh, very clearly. And then I'll be focusing on how companies practically comply with uh, or try to comply uh, with uh, the Strums to Judgment and what it means for international data transfers. Uh, through the EDPB data transfer methodology. So I'm going to go through the six steps that the EDPB has fleshed out and try to, um, to indicate the main uh, pain points for companies and the main issues that uh, they're, they, they've been facing challenges with. And then I'm going to conclude with some uh, key takeaways. So as uh, we all know here, um, pursuant to the Strums 2 decision, the privacy field got invalidated in July. And further to that, the SECs uh, remain valid. However, they can only be used under certain circumstances. Now, this in its own right is quite a change from a practical standpoint, because what we saw before was that companies used SECs almost on an autopilot mode. Uh, they, were, uh, they are an established tool to transfer data outside the EU. Uh, so we typically see companies signing the SECs, putting them in the drawer and uh, forgetting about them. So um, one issue that we already see is that companies are now way more proactive in trying to meaningfully implement the SECs and in a way that is compliant with the GDPR and EU data protection law altogether. So that is already um, a big difference that we've seen since July. Now, of course, we're expecting the new SECs um, fairly soon. Um, which should accommodate also processor to processor and processor to controller scenarios, uh, which are uh, very welcome uh, from, uh, from businesses, particularly processor, processors in Europe that want to transfer data outside Europe, uh, which under the current regime um, they, they cannot do. And the new SECs will likely have a one year transition period, but of course, uh, I refer to you as the, the, the expert in the field, uh, Alisa and Leonardo, maybe to inform us a bit better on um, how this looks like. Um, and finally, with regard to Brexit, even though it's not directly related to SRAMS 2, um, there were fears that the, there would be uh, an issue with environmental data transfers. However, now with the interim uh, decision, uh, we will still have uh, free data flows over the next months and uh, hopefully uh, an adequacy decision uh, before the, the end of this interim period. Now, moving on, um, we will be structuring this presentation around um, the EDPB recommendations on measures to supplement transfers to ensure compliance pursuant uh, to the SRAMS 2 judgment. And in particular, I'm going to go through uh, the six main steps that the EDPB itself has laid out. So as you see here, step number one is to identify and assess relevant data for transfers. Step two, to identify the data export mechanism. Step three, to assess data protection laws and practices uh, of the importing country, uh, also known as the Transfer Risk Assessment or TRA. Four, identify specific information security measures, to, uh, which are also known as supplementary measures. Five, practically implement those. And six, periodically reevaluate those safeguards to ensure that there is an adequate level of protection for the data that is being transferred um, outside the EU. Now, this methodology applies to all EU data exports. And of course, it's very important because it relates to accountability. And at the same time, data importers outside of the EU are also affected. So 
one of the dominant facts of the SRAM2 judgment naturally is that uh, it's not only companies in the EU, but of course companies outside the EU, including small and medium enterprises and startups that are importing data uh, that need uh, to read the judgment, the ATPB data transfer methodology, and decide how they can um, practically comply with uh, what the judgment requires uh, from a data protection standpoint. Now, the step number one, um, which is quite basic, is uh, for companies to map all transfers of data that are leaving the EU. I'm saying that it's basic because, you know, it sounds quite intuitive that every company should be mapping their data transfers. However, in practice, it can get quite arduous because by transfers, we also mean uh, onward transfers. So for instance, if we have a data transfer from the EU to the US and then an onward transfer from the US to say um, uh, you know, Brazil, that onward transfer should also be mapped. And um, just accessing the data also counts as a transfer. So in practice, we see that companies are already struggling with this uh, requirement because creating a data map of all those transfers and data transfers can be um, extremely burdensome in practice. At the same time, uh, when they're using uh, vendors outside the EU that may have employees working around the world, and now with the COVID pandemic, of course, teleworking is more, is more eminent than ever, then accessing the data from remote locations also counts as a transfer. So it's, um, it's quite tough to actually control this entire process. So that is um, already something that companies are doing but they are, they're facing difficulties um, in meaningfully uh, documenting um, every transfer and on one transfer, including access of the data. The second step has to do with identifying the relevant uh, data export mechanism. So here, as you see, we have uh, three different pillars. First is whether a country of import is whitelisted according to Article 45 of the GDPR. If that's the case, then no further action is required. Um, and you see here in parentheses uh, the countries that are whitelisted. Uh, the pillar number two is whether we rely on the appropriate safeguards of Article 46. And here, the most the, the most commonly used one is, of course, the standard contractual clauses. Uh, PCRs are still considered the gold standard, but of course, very few companies um, have PCRs in place. And then with regard to a cause of contact and certification, um, you know, this is uh, still in the making, so we don't really have something out there. So practically when we refer to appropriate safeguards, we refer in most of the cases to SECs that companies use. And then finally, if we rely on derogations then no further action is required, but of course relying on derogations is, um, you know, a, a different issue on its own that um, again, would probably take a, an entire conference uh, to analyze um, Interallia because derogations must be interpreted restrictively and mainly relate to processing activities that are occasional and non-repetitive. So uh, it's not a silver bullet that companies can use um, to not otherwise go through the entire exercise that the EDPP is suggesting. Then the third step, um, which is um, a very important one and at the same time um, a quite tough one in practice, is to conduct a transfer risk assessment, also known as a TRA. So there, the companies need to document the facts of the transfer, including the nature of the data, the country of destination, any onward transfers and actors involved. So here we see already how step number one informs the third step of the TRA. At the same time, they need to describe all the applicable laws that are relevant to the transfer and then interpret whether those laws can provide for an effective data transfer mechanism, including for the individuals and whether they can effectively exercise their rights in practice or whether any of the laws in the third country would actually impinge on those rights. And based on the outcome, then the companies need to evaluate whether any further action is required, either in the form of supplemental measures and whether those supplemental measures would actually suffice and allow the, uh, the company to proceed uh, with the data transfer. This is a very difficult exercise uh, for companies, uh, there have been uh, different approaches there, depending also on the size of the company. Um, we've seen that, um, you know, larger companies um, have the resources that are required to go through a very detailed uh, TRA. Uh, others, particularly smaller companies and startups, face a big challenge um, in uh, creating a meaningful TRA. So I think that here, further guidance 
on the particular questions that should be included in the TRA, and uh, maybe even a decision-making tree uh, would be very useful, particularly for uh, smaller companies. Um, at the same time, given the, the interconnected world we live in and the different data transfers, assuming that um, a company is transferring data to 10 or 20 different countries, then they would need to repeat this exercise for those countries. So of course, you can already understand that it's uh, a very burdensome uh, exercise uh, for companies. Now, once the TRA is uh, conducted, um, in every likelihood, the company will deem appropriate to identify and adopt supplementary safeguards for the data transfer. Here, we have three types of supplementary measures, including technical, contractual, and organizational. There's no exhaustive or minimum list. The ADPB has certain examples um, in both technical measures and contractual and organizational ones. Here in the pyramid, you see that I have two layers um, because according to the ADPB's language, the technical measures can impede and, rend and or render ineffective the governmental access to personal data, whereas contractual and organizational measures can complement technical measures, but on their own right, they cannot practically impede or render ineffective government access. So here we see that in terms of priority, technical measures are more important and contractual and organizational measures can actually complement the technical measures that um, otherwise companies have uh, implemented. And in terms of a few examples, technical measures primarily relate to encryption oppressed and encryption uh, in transit, client-side encryption, pseudonymization, and multi-party processing, where the core processing is done within the EU and ancillary processing outside the EU. Contractual measures include uh, that there are no backdoors that allow access to personal data, uh, publications of transparency reports, a reiteration of the power uh, of the data exporter to audit the data importer. And finally, organizational measures include uh, internal policies with clear responsibilities for uh, data transfers and reporting channels in a clear way to process and review the legality of any government request and try to block any disclosure or if that is not possible to provide the minimum information that is possible. Now, an important item in terms of the practical considerations for those information security measures. One, I think it's important to clarify that it is a risk balancing exercise. Again, there's no silver bullet as to what companies can actually do and that if they impl implement those measures, then they can undo or completely undo any data transfer concerns. So they need to balance internally uh, what are the measures that they can undertake and whether they think that those measures um, would be considered sufficient if they were ever need to actually provide uh, that type of a justification to an authority. And again, there are different questions out there that we see from companies. One of them is, you know, what if we have encryption in transit and at rest, but the data importer holds keys to the for instance, right? Would that mean that actually there's no meaning in the encryption whatsoever? Um, so these are all interesting questions that companies have. At the same time, we see that um, we are kind of in the process of another battle of the form, so to speak, between the data exporter and data importer, because data exporters tend to ask um, for a number of measures that uh, may be extremely burdensome, particularly for smaller companies, um, also, some measures that the ADPB has recommended may be very challenging to comply with, for example, the warrant canary method, uh, where uh, the data uh, importer sends a signal to the data exporter every 24 hours, and if no signal is sent, then that means that um, data may have been shared, um, and that can also lead to false alarms, of course. As I've already mentioned, the measures can be difficult for small companies. And then finally, and I guess that's uh, one of the questions that we can be discussing later on, because I, I personally find that particularly fascinating, is whether pursuant to the terms to judgment, we're actually uh, in seeing the beginning of a trend towards data localization in the EU, just because um, of the difficulty that companies have to practically comply with the judgment in a meaningful way. And finally, and I will be uh, concluding my presentation with the, the two last steps very quickly. Um, step number five is that companies need to practically implement the supplementary safeguards. Um, here, I'm just going to say that there's no need to request authorization from a supervisory authority to adopt supplementary measures, assuming that they do not contradict the SECs and that they do not restrict rights and obligations in the SECs. However, 
supervisory authorities can review supplementary measures where required. So it's important for companies to uh, sufficiently document any supplementary measures they take. And uh, finally, last step, uh, which is step number six, is that companies need to periodically reevaluate the safeguards. They need to keep monitoring the developments in third countries on an ongoing basis because accountability is a continuing obligation. And at the same time, they need to have mechanisms in place to suspend and or end transfers where the data importer has breached or cannot comply with their commitments, or if the supplementary measures are no longer effective in the third country. So on a final note, and with that, I'm going to give the floor back to Alisa. Uh, we see that this is a dynamic and ongoing uh, situation. Of course, companies have been trying uh, to comply with the judgment, depending on their size, uh, operations, and where they are based. This may be more challenging than in other circumstances. Companies are overall eagerly uh, expecting the new SECs, uh, which I think is a very welcome addition. Um, to the data protection framework in Europe. And going through the six step methodology of the EDPB can be a very resource intensive exercise uh, for companies. I tried to flesh out some um, of the main concerns that companies have. And I see, I think that from the six steps, step number three and four, so TRA and uh, the supplementary measures are probably the most challenging in terms of practical implementation and uh, meaningful documentation. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the Q&A session later on. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolaus. Um, then I will go to our next speaker, Eduardo. For you, um, a similar question. I know that you work with a lot of big companies uh, around the world so on, on privacy and data protection issues. So a similar question from your practical experience, how do you see businesses approaching this? Do you see any interesting strategies or best practices or tools being developed to, to help, help companies come comply with this? Thank you very much. And um, it was a, a great introduction to the topic. And it, it, perhaps to summarize from the beginning what I think is the most important message here, we're talking about the practicalities of compliance. So in my, in my experience, and yeah, taking into account what has been going on in the past few months. I think the most important message is that we should focus on what we can do, not on what you cannot do. And, 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 and I elaborate on that. Much of the debate of the past six months has focused on things that are outside our control and outside the control of many organizations, like, for example, changes in the US legal framework which, of course, part of the solution or perhaps the most uh, clear-cut aspect uh, or way of, of resolving these issues is to ensure that the entire world, all countries around the world, uh, apply enough controls to the uh, powers of the state that meet European standards. That will solve the problem. But that is always going to be work in progress for, for, for the foreseeable future. And it's certainly not something that is within people's control and organizations control. And another um, aspect of this debate that has attracted much attention and Nicolas was reflecting, referring to this is data localization. So is data localization a solution? Well, I, again, in my experience, Data localization is simply not viable, at least not viable in 99% in, in of the cases where transfers are taking place. Because we live in a, in a global world, the whole point of international data tra transfers is to enable that globalization to, to happen. And organizations operate around the world uh, and provide the services, provide services throughout the world. So data localization is one of those things that we could agonize uh, over the merits or, 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 or not. But again, it's not something that is within our control. Therefore, to, to, for the purposes of this discussion, I think that the question really is, what can you do taking into account that the European Court of Justice decision was not about where the data goes or whether data transfers should be prohibited. The decision was about 
how to protect the data when it flows around the world from indiscriminate access to data by government, but from, from unjustified access by public authorities. What can you do to protect it in that scenario? And Nicolas has very helpfully gone through the very detailed uh, guidance that was published at the end of last year by the EDPB. And I don't want to add um, overlap too much with, with that, but there are a few pointers I wanted to refer to, which I have seen over the past few months as being effective or, or being, uh, again, practical aspects of how to resolve this issue. One of the uh, elements of the EDPB guidance that Nicolas referred to was about identifying the transfer. So basically knowing where your data is going. And I don't think that this necessarily merits some kind of full blown audit or data mapping exercise, because in reality, uh, that is something that uh, you, could, uh, you could spend your entire life doing and still not protect the data. So the question is, how do you get a picture of where the data is going that is sufficiently reliable in a, in a, in a, in a pragmatic way? And there are a couple of pointers in this in, to take into account. One is the, the records of processing. Of course, the GDPR introduced this new obligation for organizations, for controllers to keep records of processing. And one of the, one of the items of those records is details of transfers. So it's perhaps time to dig out those, those records of processing that many organizations were rushing to preparing in, in, in 2017, 2018, and, and look at what those records of process say, say about transfers of data. It's also a good idea to look at what existing mechanisms are in place. Many companies that we work with, um, we say, talk to your procurement department. Your, your, your procurement department will know who the vendors are or the key vendors are, and that will give you uh, an idea of, of where the data is going. So there are very, these are very specific practical steps that can be taken without, under, without under, undertaking a whole audit. Another aspect uh, in terms of practical solutions to this is that I think it's really important to be able to categorize the, the, the data transfers. And by that, I mean, we need to understand what level of risk a particular transfer attracts, risk of, of this type of indiscriminate access. And that's going to depend on a number of factors. For example, one is the nature of the data. I think that, again, the evidence that we've seen, we have seen, and, and, and indeed the laws that exist around the world, suggest that different types of data will attract a different degree of risk of this type of indiscriminate access. The roles of the parties are also important because in order to really assess the, the, the risk and, and the potential exposure of the data, it's important to understand whether the data is going to a controller or within your own organization or to a vendor and what type of vendor and is this vendor subject to, uh, again, government decrees. So I think understanding the roles uh, of the parties involved is very important. And of course, the location of the data, different countries will have different laws. So I think the point I'm trying to make here is that not all transfers of data are the same. They attract different degrees of risk. And I think that's important in order to then apply the solution. Connected to this is what Nicolas referred to as po possibly the most difficult element of this exercise, which is to assess the impact that the local laws around the world may have on the protection of this data. That is to understand to what extent different countries have different powers that would allow those government agencies, those public authorities, that level on this, of discriminate access. To say uh, that this is a difficult exercise is, is an understatement. If you think about for example, the case in, in the US, so far, all the attention, all the SRAMS cases since, um, you know, for, for the past, I don't know, five, six, seven years, 
have focus on one country in the in the world. You know, there are hundred and I think there's 196 countries in the world. And we've spent the last seven years assessing whether uh, the US allows indiscriminate access to personal data. So if we were to spend the same amount of time in, for every single country that receives personal data, we could, we, we, it would be a, a lifetime. And the, the point I'm making is that I guess we need to assume that most countries will have that potential, will have that degree of access. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the world has to stop. I think what we need to understand is that uh, and assume that yes, there will be access, and yes, over time, uh, research organizations and law firms and academics and so on will untap and will uncover the degree of access that government agencies have across the world. But you can rest assured that the less transparent a government is, the probably the greater potential for access there is going to be. So I think uh, the onus is, of course, on, on many governments to, 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 to say, look, this is what we do with data. This is the potential for access. But from a practical perspective, while we wait for, for, for that to happen over the next few years, I think we need to assume a degree of access and, and factor that in. Uh, which takes me to the, to the final point, which is about, okay, so taking all of that into account, compliance is about effectively protecting the data. From, from this type of access. How do we protect the data? And um, one uh, also practical approach that we have seen is to apply a different degree of priority, if you want, a different degree of risk. So you could have a sort of low risk, medium risk, high risk, you know, where low risk, again, depending on the type of data, the countries, the, um, the, the roles of the parties, maybe for a low risk type situation, the standard contractual clauses are just good enough. And in fact, we are, we, we are uh, maybe a month or two away from seeing the new version, the final, ver the final uh, adopted version of, of the new standard contractual clauses, which already have uh, some protections in this respect. And that may be sufficient for many transfers, many for most transfers, the FCC may be sufficient. There is a second level of risk that you could say, well, um, on balance, I think we need to go farther than just the standard contractual clauses. And that's where in particular, those contractual and organizational measures that the EDPB refers to can be extremely powerful and extremely helpful. And it is perhaps in only those cases where there is a true high risk because of the nature of the data, because of the nature of, of the transfer of the country, that companies really need to try their best to apply those technical measures, which again are very difficult to implement, but that those are the, the, the ones that deserve that or that level of that high risk transfer, which maybe is more proportion, those are the ones that um, deserve the technical measures. And a couple of words on on going back to the contractual and organizational measures. And I said, as I said, these are powerful measures to stop what the European Court of Justice was concerned about. Again, it's very important not to overdo it, not to think, oh, all access to data is unlawful. No, it's, it's, it's that that goes beyond what, what, it, what, is, what is necessary uh, in, a, in a democratic society using the, the, the language of law. And therefore, it's important to assess, for example, what in practice, what the key service providers around the world are doing. There is, we've seen a lot of work from service providers, from, from vendors, uh, taking the steps in order to say to their customers, your data is safe with us. So I think there is, that is a very important uh, focus of attention for most organizations to, to understand what their key vendors, their key service providers are doing in, in, in as part of that organization measure. And then <clears throat> the very final point is that uh, what we have seen is organizations adopting uh, disclosure protocols or disclosure uh, mechanisms effectively uh, 
mechanisms or, or protocols that govern the procedure to provide access to data or not to provide access to data, how to challenge. We have seen organizations and, and companies that as a matter of uh, policy, they challenge every single request for access to data they get from any government agency. And they challenge it with an, uh, with the standard forms, which says, thank you very much for this request. Can you answer these questions about your powers, about the scope of the data, whether you need it, whether, what you're going to do with it. So these are the steps, the practical steps that will go in the direction that the European Court of Justice was seeking, which is at the end of the day, to protect the data in a way that is realistic and that achieves that level of protection that in Europe we have used. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo. Um, and I think you made some very interesting and important points because I think indeed it's we also have to recognize in this discussion that the judgment does leave some flexibility and a key aspect of, of complying with it is indeed looking at the specific of, of its, each transfer and uh, taking into account all circumstances of the transfer and then on that basis decide whether additional steps, additional measures are needed and which ones are needed if, if needed. Um, but okay, I'm, I'm mindful of the time. I think if we want to leave some uh, time for, for questions, we have to, to move on for now. So I will then give the floor to our next panelist, uh, Kira. Kira, I understand that you will look at this or talk about this from the perspective of health research, in particular um, health researchers in South Africa. So beyond the, the practical impact of the TREMS 2 judgment on those that, that transfer data, it would also be very interesting to hear your views or your perspective on more general developments that we see in, in South Africa, because in, in general, in the past years and months, we've seen a lot of countries developing privacy laws, modernizing privacy laws, and I think the strategic judgment also highlighted the importance of, of this convergence uh, in, around the world. And I know that South Africa is one of the countries that recently started to move also on, on modernizing its data protection regime. So we're very interested uh, to hear your views. Yes, sure. Can I get my slides up, please? Um, just while they're loading. Um, so I'd like to thank, first of all, the um, organizers for the invitation um, to be here. Um, and I'm going to focus on um, health data. And most of my research, um, I look at uh, the use of health data, particularly genomic research data in uh, Um, so most of my work um, has focused on um, the use of health data in South Africa and um, within in Europe. Um, and so over the next 10 minutes, I'm very much going to focus on that. But what I'm actually going to do is that I'm going to do it through the lens of equity in health research. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to do three things. First of all, just to ensure that we're all on the same page, I'm first going to start talk about um, international data sharing in the context of health research generally, the need for it, uh, but also the barriers to that sharing of data. Then following on from um, the question and the kind of frame that Lisa just gave, I'm going to talk about uh, the impact um, of this, uh, G the GDPR has had on our, or the other jurisdictions, um, most notably in South Africa. So I'm going to focus on what the, what's said in the literature, but also pull through some experiences from my own work. Um, and then third, I'm going to focus on the, um, the judgment, the likely impact that it has has on health research and just kind of some flag some concerns that I would have uh, more broadly um, on its impact in health research. OK, now, so if we um, look at the I don't think my slides are up, so I'm just going to go ahead without it. Um, OK, um, now, if we look at the international sharing of data um, since the Human Genome Project, we really have seen a very much a push towards open science and making data and the results of research available for others to use. Now, 
The importance and value of this data sharing is often stressed. We know that it leads to collaborations, which is good for research. And increasingly, we are seeing more international collaborations and multi-site research. I myself have been on, involved in a number of um, international collaborative genomics projects while based in South Africa. Uh, and this is good for science, you know, more collaborations. It leads to more reproducible science. It promotes new research on existing data sets. And it also maximizes the utility of the data. Uh, we also absolutely need more diversity in global health research, both from those who are doing the research and on the populations uh, that we're doing the research on. And I think if we look at the current situation with COVID and the emergence of these new variants, we see very, very clearly the importance of genomic sequencing of samples across the world. Now, this sharing of data, it's, it's a real value in collaborations, particularly where expertise is lacking, lacking or capacities need to be built. But it's also important that the sharing of data can also save the expense of others from getting the data themselves, which is important in the context of scarce research resources. Um, also, it's worth bearing in mind that this sharing of data and open science is also seen as one of the drivers um, of innovations. So in addition to saving potentially patient lives, it can also improve the economy. And in South Africa, the Department of Science and Innovation has pointed to this and said that it's a key factor in the um, fourth industrial revolution. So we know the benefits. We know that it's there are a lot of benefits, but the question is, what are the barriers? Well, I think currently I would see that there is technical, economic, ethical, and legal barriers. Um, from the technical side, there are numerous. Um, it requires access to bandwidth, access to the source of electricity, um, but we also have rep uh, reports of it taking up to 90 days for large data sets to come from a US institution to an African institution. Um, looking at it from an economic point of view, um, data sharing requires human and technical resources, which costs a lot of money, and e addressing all of the barriers that I'm going to go through requires cost. From an ethical point of view, um, historically, um, many researchers across the African continent were historically seen as sample collectors, where the um, data was collected um, in the country and shipped to the um, a high income country for uh, research there. Um, now, that kind of practice isn't necessarily confined to the past. And last year, when I was in, um, conducting some empirical work on this in South Africa, um, a couple of um, researchers reflect on the fact that they had been in conferences, international conferences, where they've seen data from their institution used and no acknowledgement of the, um, the data collector. And then for the individual data subjects, there's, of course, the privacy issues, but then there's the wider cultural issues that apply to the use of these biological samples and its data that are prevalent in some um, African communities that do need to be acknowledged. Now looking, and where I'm going to focus on for the rest, is on the legal issues. Uh, we're seeing different legal frameworks um, across the... Uh, across the um, um, so we're seeing different legal, um, we're just seeing different um, legal frameworks across the um, globe, and there is this kind of con um, convergence and you know this uh, disparities between the um, legislation. Um, now, different international bodies and consortia have tried to have common practices as it applies to data sharing, um, but we do lack a harmonised framework in this domain. So when we are looking at the international sharing of data, there are tensions and trade-offs um, that we see. There are a number of competing interests. We have you know, individual privacy rights. We need to have um, need for individuals or for scientific research. And I don't think these are necessarily, it's not one or the other, but there are different issues that we do need to consider. But we also need to ensure that this use and sharing of data is done in a way that continues to safeguard um, participants and mitigates against rights. Now turning to equity, um, I think, you know, looking at the rollout of vaccines across the world, we very much see that we are living in a deeply un uh, inequitable uh, world. But what I want to consider is the impact that data protection standards could have on this inequity. So what we do know is that the GDPR has had an impact on the use of personal data in research um, with, within Europe. Um, and we do know that it has particular um, derogations and exceptions for the use of research, which we are 
currently grappling with, we do see the argument that the GDPR should not apply to research. I absolutely do not accept that um, argument. Uh, while research is often um, in the public interest and can justify limiting rights, there is an equal public interest in safeguarding the rights and interests of the data subjects in research, which must be kept in mind. And failure to do so will and likely or could lead to a loss in trust between researchers and um, the data subjects and a breakup of our social contract. Now that is looking at Europe, looking further field, um, the GDPR has been quite influential in other jurisdictions in strengthening their data protection frameworks. For example, South Africa, it has this uh, Protection of Personal Information Act or PAPIA. It was passed in 2013, but it actually only came into force um, in July of last year. And if you look at the legislation, it's been very, very much influenced by an earlier draft of the um, GDPR. But we, what we see now is that researchers are really grappling and trying to struggle to, uh, to understand the impact that the PAPIA is having on its data practices. Um, and the work that I've been done, doing over the past 18 months with the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, it's trying to figure out how to meet these higher and stronger um, standards while ensuring that it continue to um, roll out its national treatment and research products. And um, we've also just seen, it was announced last year, that the South African Academy um, of Sciences is in the process of developing a code of conduct uh, that will apply to uh, researchers in the country. But what's interesting to note, it is only looking at, at the moment, at local compliance. It is only looking at the impact of PAPIA on its use of health data there. So we, we know that standards have been raised, which is great. And this was very, in the work, in the qualitative work that I was doing last year, it was seen as a very good thing. There's a need to do it. Um, it's going to, it's thought that it's going to uh, increase the reputation of the individual institutions, but it'll also increase and improve security standards. But this is going to have and is having serious resource implications. Um, there's a need to know what to do, um, need to hire extra staff, there's a need to implement organizational and technical standards. And the concerns has been expressed um, from some researchers that it's only actually well-resourced um, institutions that will actually be able to meet these costs. So already when just looking at Papia, there are already concerns about the impact um, of smaller, less well-refunded research institutions and teams to meet um, these uh, new standards. So, Overall, I think the GDPR is welcomed and is very much seen as an opportunity to ensure that data protection standards are increased in Europe and also worldwide. Um, there is this concern about the impact it's going to have on the ability of research um, institutions as it reaches teams to pay. And also the more fundamental question of who should actually be paying. Now, if we look um, to the, go to the last part of my talk, which is going to be on the judgment itself. Um, COVID has demonstrated that in an emergency situation, there are flexibilities to ensure that health data can be shared and that this is permitted um, for research purposes. It's to be welcomed, of course, we absolutely need it, but it has been stressed that this has been, um, this is going to be um, um, an exception. So what is the overall impact in the kind of global health research um, domain? Well, we've seen the US report um, that the NIH has stalled uh, 40 um, studies while it considers that. But what of elsewhere? And when I was asked to sit on this panel, I was asked to reflect on the impact that the judgment has had on uh, researchers in South Africa. But I think it's very much a feeling of Schrems who um, because the decisions of um, discussions I've had, they're very much focused on ensuring local compliance. And the concerns that they are having on the GDPR is, first of all, how is Papilla different from the GDPR? And if I comply with one, am I going to comply with the other? So in reality, I don't think the significance of this judgment has actually trickled down to the research teams. Now, looking forward, what can we do? Well. You know, we could have had a crazy decision in context of health research, but I don't need to go in and explain, you know, how that is and not practical in the short term. So I suppose there are kind of two options. Uh, perhaps we can rely on consent. Um, 
course, this is going to be challenging. And I would raise the question of maybe this is a time when we need to consider dynamic consent in research um, uh, more seriously. Um, it could indeed play a role where we can go back and ask um, more easily uh, research participants if they do want to consent to the um, international sharing of data. But I think that's important. That could be perhaps useful for research teams going forward who can begin to embed in dynamic consent into their uh, protocol. But for now, we're, we're looking like we're going to have to be we're left with Article 46. And in the context of health research, I would have concerns that it is going to limit uh, collaborative research and health research. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have to require this assessment. And who's going to do it? Um, it's going to require, um, you know, analysis between the two pieces of legislation, where the differences are, and whether or not PPIA has an appropriate level of protection. But who's going to do it? It's fine for the bigger universities, for example, University of Cape Town. It's a well-resourced, well-funded uh, institution with with a robust uh, uh, research ethics framework in place. But what of the smaller research institutions? Are they going to be able to afford the assessment? to afford the um, technical and organizational standards that they may need to implement to meet these uh, criteria. And if we are going to try and encourage a diversity of research, we need more research teams involved, but the smaller research teams may not be able to um, pay. And for research that's currently ongoing, um, is that going to come out of the direct costs? And if it is, does that mean that there's going to be less research um, to funds to be paid overall towards the research? A final point, and this echoes what others have been saying, is that I am wondering, um, is these concerns and around all this means that while data can go into the EU for research, it's going to stop data going out. So we're going to go back to this unidirectional flow of research, which is absolutely not what we want to do in the context of global health uh, research. Now, we'll finish off on this one final point, um, and I'm going to reflect back on the preliminary opinion on scientific research that recommended this broad debate that is needed on um, the GDPR's public interest clause for scientific research. And it was um, the importance of wide engagement on this um, is necessary. I completely agree with this, but I, argue, I would argue that we actually need to have a more global component to that um, um, engagement. Because in a global globalized world, these policy conversations must be informed by experiences in other jurisdictions. We are living in a time when it's clear how, to, the importance of international collaborative research. Um, but we're also witnessing um, the real inequity in global health research. So what I would urge is that in considering how to safeguard our fundamental rights in research, we do need to, which includes um, issues around data protection, we do need to consider issues of um, equity of access and equity in health research um, overall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kira. It's a very interesting perspective. And I think this indeed also again underlines the, the importance of, of developing certain, certain convergence and, and standards at global level, not only for research, but more generally, I think in the area of, of data protection. Okay, see, we're really running out of time. I hope that since we started five, 10 minutes late, maybe we can get those extra minutes to, uh, to have some more questions from the audience. But I will now give the floor to our last panelist, uh, Leonardo, to discuss the, um, uh, from the EDPS point of view, what the impact has been of the judgment, I would say then more from the perspective of public authorities and specifically the, the EU institutions and perhaps also how you see the role of data protection authorities in, in this context, not only from the perspective of, of enforcement, but also when it comes to uh, providing guidance and assistance. And I will say, I will, very sorry for that, but I, let's say that I will cut you off <laughs> at five to one uh, at the latest so that we can uh, still have some questions. Very sorry for that. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Alisa for your presentation and um, I wanted to congratulate you and your colleagues for the recent work you have done on the new set of standard contractual clauses. Um, when I was a young commission official, um, 
I used to have more hair in, in the top of my head that I have now. I was given the task of uh, drafting the first set of standard contractual clauses back in 2001. So I'm a little bit familiar with this topic, although obviously I'm not following it so closely as you and um, the colleagues in this panel are doing. So I will focus more on the big picture rather than on the details, because for the details, you're clearly better place to, to make comments. Um, the way I see this is that we are confronted with a um, generational issue. This issue of um, highlighted by Schrems II ruling has been around now for a whole generation. And um, for some time, the EU or the European communities at the time had some difficulties to persuade other countries or the areas of the world to um, abide to our data protection standards. But this is no longer the case. Uh, now, uh, after the GDPR, we have um, over 100 countries around the world with uh, horizontal data protection laws. But unfortunately, uh, this is not yet the case for the US for a series of reasons that we cannot, we don't have the time to elaborate now. But uh, this is very unfortunate because um, the rest of the world, we have such a um, dependence from the US in terms of IT, that uh, this puts us in a, a very awkward situation and we need to fix this situation. So in Europe, the rule of law principle is not uh, decorative. It's one of the pillars of our union. And therefore, we cannot live anymore with this uh, disconnection between the reality of big tech and what our law says. And this is what Schrems II is all about. We have to find a way to fix this uh, for once because the GDPR has been in place already for five years and soon it will be three years is, is into force. So nobody can claim that the letter of the law has taken them by surprise. So how do we get out of this situation? My opinion is that all relevant stakeholders, third country governments, data importers, data exporters and data protection authorities need to fulfill their own resp responsibilities in good faith. So I cannot comment on the intentions of the new US, US administration, but I can tell you that the EDPV has made a, a genuine and serious effort to provide guidance and to speak with one voice. And I would like to thank very much the colleagues in the EDPS and EDPV secretariat that have been working flat out really to produce these recommendations and to um, the recent uh, joint opinions on standard contractual clauses are a good example. So the, uh, I know I, I have to finish now, but um, the message I would like to, to pass is that um, it is a joint responsibility and this is what we are doing uh, from the EDPS. So we have told our EU institutions that they need to analyze the legality of their transfers and they um, have, have to act when there's something that they can reasonably fix. For example, by amending the, the contractual terms, they should do it. But when something cannot be fixed reasonably, then they have to consider suspending the transfers or to find another service provider that will be able to comply with, uh, with the law. So I think this calls for a serious reflection about the way international cooperation functions. We're in the middle of a, a pandemic and we are seeing a tragic and unprecedented uh, situation of um, economic crisis, um, death. And I think there is room for doing better in terms of international cooperation. The same way we will not manage to fix the, this problem with the virus or the coronavirus, we will not be able to fix the endemic problems of this information society if we don't work together and decisively. So this is why I would like to finish with the thought that uh, my boss, Wojciech Wiborowski, is repeating, say, he's saying, mind the endemic in the middle of the pandemic. Our information world, uh, digital world has some systemic problems that need to be fixed. And this issue of the uh, transfer of personal data to third countries and the undue interference by some state authorities is one of those issues that we need to uh, fix by close cooperation. So I hope that, that there is a real political willingness to do that.
and I'm sure if this is the case that there will be technical solutions at hand with the help of uh, so many colleagues who are knowledgeable about these things. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I think you indeed, uh, I think we've made a nice uh, turn. We, we started with the very practical issues and we, we ended with more fundamental questions because I, I think indeed the Schrems II judgment has raised some important questions, more general ones in particular, how do you, how can you protect data when it flows around the world every second as we speak, there's data flows have become such a, a crucial part of our lives. How can you ensure the protection of, of data in this context? And I think what is interesting to see is that we are seeing certain initiatives also at, at global level to start working on, on these things, on these questions between like-minded uh, countries. There's, for example, very interesting work going on in the OECD on developing standards on disproportionate co government access at, at international level. So I think um, there's still work to be done, but there are some interesting developments. Okay, I think I would say we used the last minutes that we have for some questions from the audience, if there are questions from the audience. So I'm looking at my at the, the call managers to let us know if there's any questions from the audience. I don't see the chat box of the live stream, I have to say. I only see, I don't know if, if the other panelists and then <laughs> feel free to answer. <laughs> but otherwise, I think, um, yeah, I think we, we, I'm happy to, to, to ask then another question to, to our panelists. Um, I think we, we talked indeed a lot about the, the different challenges that come, uh, that come from the Schrems to judgment. And I think it's, it's true that it's not easy for, especially for smaller companies to, to deal with this. But at the same time, I think um, that the judgment also leaves certain flexibility, in particular to focus on the specifics of the transfer, to really take into account um, all circumstances of the transfer. And I was wondering if we could touch, uh, go a bit deeper into that, how you see this, um, how, how companies can approach this, or whether there's any interesting tools or be best practices that are being developed to do this this case by case assessment, maybe also from the perspective of, of the EDPS, I don't know, um, and how you see the relationship and the, the role for the the data exporter on the one hand and the data importer on on the other hand, because in, in principle the obligation is on the data exporter, but I think the importer will inevitably also play an important role as it is the entity that knows its its own legal framework uh, best. Alisa, if I if I may, um, I think you can count on the EDPS and the EDPV to help as much as we can. Uh, we are conscious of the need of uh, guidance and um, a reasonable approach, but um, we should not fool ourselves. The problem is not in Europe. Uh, Schrems II ruling uh, comes be because of um, the determination by our highest court that um, there is a problem with the US law. Therefore, uh, this is the main concern, and this is what needs to be fixed quickly. We can, of course, in the meantime, help, um, uh, give advice, assist. Uh, we will do it, no, no doubt. But um, the, the solution has to come from, from the US, because this is where the problem lies. And this is not a problem uh, from yesterday. It's a problem that we had for, for quite a long time. So this is what I call for a genuine effort of international cooperation and dialogue to, to fix this issue quickly. And, and please do not expect data protection authorities to come with a solution that it is not in our hands. Well, I can tell you, don't want to take the, the time away from other speakers, but I can assure you that uh, the Commission is working on this together with, with the United States. Uh, of course, it's not an easy question. It's uh, an area that is very sensitive, but uh, yes, we are we're working on this. I don't know if in the meantime we've received um, questions. Otherwise, I will open the floor to, to the other panelists if they want to react to something that has been said or answer one of my previous uh, questions in more detail. 
then I'll give the floor to, to any of you. Is anyone who wants to react maybe to anything that was said? I think Eduardo I find it fascinating that um, the position, of course, that both uh, the EDPS alongside the EDPB and the European Commission uh, are taking on this because I think it's, it's a mindset issue. By that I mean, Leonardo is right that what the court said, well, you need to assess the transfers and then in the context of the US, we can see that these are the handicaps for, for transfers to the US to be safe or to be uh, adequate. But uh, the question is, how do you resolve that? Because I think, uh, and that's what I'm saying, it's a mindset issue. And I, I think, Alisa, from what you're saying, uh, the commission appears to be the right, to, to have the right mindset because a lot of attempts and a lot of voices have focused on almost how to stop transfers. You know, that's the, the, the objective is we need to stop the transfers. And we live in a world, and Leonardo, you mentioned the pandemic. You know, the only thing that can travel is data. If we don't let the data travel, how are we going to solve the problems that we have in the world? So I think uh, it is for that reason that I was trying to emphasize that we really need to try our best to make it happen. And yes, for the commission is to try to uh, use its diplomatic uh, efforts and its, its policy efforts to persuade uh, the US and indeed all, all the countries around the world to try to be as democratic as they can be. But I think we also need to be realistic. And when we have seen what we have seen that was going on in the US two or three weeks ago, and perhaps, uh, a, a country that we most people would regard as a democratic country and uh, that has its own challenges. I think uh, we need we need to be realistic about what can be done, particularly what can be done in the short term. That's not to say that the uh, the commission should not be making every single effort to 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 bridge that gap. And I hope that there is such a thing as however we call it safe harbor or, or, or privacy shield three or, or, or whatever is in place to bridge that gap despite the criticisms but ultimately as i say it's a mindset issue where we the efforts are devoted to allow the data to travel rather than to disallow that to happen alisa if i if I may, uh, very quickly, uh, Eduardo, I think uh, we, we've been working on this, you and I, uh, together on this for many, many years. I think we all agree. And uh, the mindset, um, our mindset, I, I would like to be very clear about that, is not to block transfer. You know very well that data protection is both about protecting individuals and the free flow of data, which is fundamental for our economies. Our mindset is to improve the situation and to make sure that the data is safe no matter what the data is. We don't care if the data is in Europe or uh, elsewhere. What we care is that the data is reasonably and pr protected and in particular um, safe from um, a state um, intervention. This is something that is particularly important for our court. And this is what we are. We need to work on with our allies in the, in the US. But uh, we fully agree. Uh, we have no interest in transferring data. I don't think this is the, the solution. The solution is to find um, protection for the data, no, mat no matter whether what the data is. Thank you. Can we have a last comment from Nicolaus? I saw him raising his hand and then we will wrap up. All right. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be super, super, super quick. Just a few seconds just to, to echo the, the points that uh, the other colleagues mentioned. I don't think that data localization uh, is a solution. I think we should focus on um, you know innovation uh, and the GDPR is designed in a way to trigger innovation. So I think it's really important to, to keep doing that. And that finally, um, it's important to develop tools so that companies can comply with the terms to judgment in a meaningful way so that we don't end up with tick the box exercises because no one wants that at the end of the day. That's all.
Thank you very much. I think that was a perfect comment to, to end our discussion. I know we, we really have to stop, so I will not make any concluding remarks, but I think we, we covered a lot of, of issues from different perspectives. I think we had a very interesting discussion. So thank you very much to, to our panelists. Thank you very much, Alisa. Excellent moderation. Thank you.